Hi, and welcome once again to Simply Science. I'm Barry Mitchell. Today, we're at the National Geographic encounter Ocean Odyssey in Times Square, where they take you on an interactive undersea tour of the Pacific Ocean. Speaking of our oceans, they're getting warmer and the levels are dangerously rising. Our Susan Jun spoke with famed aquanaut and ocean conservationist Fabian Cousteau about the state of our oceans. The ocean is the world's life support system, soaking up the majority of excess heat emitted by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. But at what cost? A new UN report on the ocean and climate change paints a very bleak picture for our most vital resource. Over 100 scientists from 36 countries came together under the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to produce the recent report titled Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate. The report concludes that global warming is heating up our oceans at an alarming rate, killing coral reefs, endangering marine species, and fueling severe storms. The fact that we're not putting 110% of our attention to what is probably the biggest national security threat for any country, which is climate change, is, is akin to ignoring our, our own fate. Fabien Cousteau is the grandson of famous oceanographer and undersea explorer Jacques Cousteau. The third generation ocean explorer now runs Fabien Cousteau Ocean Learning Center in the city, which works to raise awareness and educate the public on ways to protect and preserve the planet's oceans. Cousteau says the UN's report puts into print the devastating findings oceanographers have been witnessing firsthand. The ocean absorbs over 50% of our man-made CO2. That sounds like a great thing, but that CO2 then through a chemical reaction becomes carbonic acid. That carbonic acid that's now in the water system in the ocean attacks calcium carbonate systems. Calcium carbonate systems, to make, put it bluntly, are shellfish, zooplankton, which are the babies, coral, which is made of calcium carbonate, and so on and so forth. And so when you have an ocean that's getting more acidic, 25% and growing, you have the breakdown or the thinning of shells, you have the breakdown of coral reefs, and so you have the temperature issue and you have the acidification issue just on the factor of climate change. And as ocean becomes hotter and more acidic, seafood supplies are threatened. Add to that the rapid melting of ice caps and glaciers leading to sea level rise that endangers low-lying coastal communities. And Cousteau says the impact on humans becomes crystal clear. The reality is, the facts are, that up until now, we've set a course that is a uh, dramatically detrimental course to all life on this planet. Everyone can play their part to protect our oceans by reducing fossil fuel use and eliminating one-use plastics. And you might be surprised to find out that recycling is our last choice. It starts with the four R's, which is refuse, reduce, reuse, and then recycle. A fifth R may be to reinvent. So you're actually 3D printing? We're 3D coral? printing coral. Okay having the uh, zooxanthellae install themselves on here, and uh -huh. then we're putting that coral back, back in, in a reef that's ready for restoration. And so now the corals are much more uh, apt to uh, resist climate change. A method Cousteau says is accelerating the evolutionary process in a way that keeps pace with the acceleration of climate change. The process is not always successful, but Cousteau says it presents an example of how technology can help us think outside the box to address the effects of global warming on our oceans before it's too late. No ocean, no life. No healthy ocean, no healthy future. It's that simple. For Simply Science, I'm Susan Jun.
the fashion industry throws away tons of textiles every year. Our Mike Gilliam met with a nonprofit that's helping to keep the fabric out of our landfill. Oh look, there's a cocktail dress fish. One man's trash can certainly end up being another's treasure. And that is absolutely true when it comes to something called fab scrap. Fab Scrap is a New York City-based nonprofit. We work with the fashion industry to redistribute and recycle their excess fabric. Jessica Schreiber is the founder of Fab Scrap. She says she got the idea when she was working in the offices of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Brands were reaching out asking what they could do with all of their fabric waste from the product development process that wasn't a garment. So not the shoes and handbags and accessories or apparel, but all of the waste material in creating those items. There really wasn't a place for them to get rid of their waste. So she came up with the idea for Fab Scrap and went and got funding in a truly millennial way. I was on season one of Project Runway Fashion Startup. Really? Um, it was sort of like Project Runway's Shark Tank. Uh -huh. um, so I pitched to a panel of four investors in the fashion industry my new fashion recycling idea, and we came away with $60,000 to get started. That's great. <laughs> one of the main ideas is to save all of this fabric that would clog landfills and wreak havoc on the environment. And we're talking a lot of fabric. So, I've been looking at this big pile that you have here, okay? <laughs> how much textile is this, first of all, and, and how would this affect the environment if it went to the landfill? Um, this is our big to-do pile. We still need to sort all of this. It's about 60,000 pounds of fabric, and keeping this amount of fabric from landfill has the CO2 reducing benefit of planting 6,000 trees. 6,000 trees? 6,000 trees, if we're able to keep all of this from landfill. Here's how it works. When a company signs up, they get two types of bags to put their scraps in. Black bags for scraps that have identifying patterns or logos that can't be recycled and must be shredded. And brown bags for fabric that can be recycled. When the bags are full, the company calls for a pickup. And all of that stuff is brought to a warehouse at the Brooklyn Army Terminal to be sorted. So the small pieces of fabric that aren't big enough to reuse um, get shredded and this raw shredded material is called shoddy and then shoddy gets used to create insulation for new buildings, carpet padding, mattress stuffing, it's used a lot in the automotive industry. The larger pieces end up either going to volunteers who get free fabric for working at Fab Scrap or are sold at thrift store rates. They also have leather, lace, trim, buttons and other items used by fashion designers. Because Fab Scrap is a nonprofit, all of the money raised through sales and donations is funneled back into the organization to be used in their effort. Since Fab Scrap opened in 2016, they say they've saved 458,000 pounds of materials from landfills. Both customers and brands have embraced the idea. We're working now with Marc Jacobs, Oscar de la Renta, J. Crew, Express, Theory. Lafayette 148, Eileen Fisher, a lot of New York-based companies. In June, Fab Scrap opened the Fab Scrap shop on the edge of the garment district in Manhattan. The idea was to get closer to the people working in the fashion industry. The shop looks like an upscale fabric shop in the city, but it's a thrift shop and the prices are right. Camille Tegel is director of reuse for Fab Scrap and a former designer. The crazy thing is that we receive yardage of fabric that is completely reusable, um, that was originally headed towards landfill. So even all of these rolls of fabric, um, these are all yardage, they just don't have the cardboard in them, but they're all available for people to shop and we just organize them in a way that is easy to, it's easily approachable and not as intimidating as a pile of fabric. <laughs> Standing in the shop amidst all the beautiful colors and textures almost makes you forget about the gritty work that's going on back at the Brooklyn Warehouse and the mission, which is to reuse and save the environment. For me, if people can understand that things that were originally destined towards landfill can be reused and upcycled and kept into circulation and have an extended life, to me that's really important. The Fab Scrap Shop is located on West 26th Street between 6th and 7th. In years to come, they hope to expand to L.A. and other cities in the U.S. and around the globe. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science.
Next, we visit the New York Hall of Science, where Andrew Falzone is checking out the world's largest Lego art exhibit, built brick by tiny brick. They're some of the best known works of art recreated in Lego form. The popular children's toy is the basis for the exhibit Art of the Brick at the New York Hall of Science. There's Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, Van Gogh's Starry Night, Munch's The Scream, Hokusai's Great Wave, and Rodin's Thinking Man all served up a la Lego. Just as we were walking in, I saw some children being very mesmerized by the classical art and the parents seeming to be very pleased. There are also original Lego creations. Some of them touch on biology and archaeology like this 20-foot long T-Rex. Others touch on psychology and self-awareness by examining the human condition. And others are just really cool. Every single person here has probably been to the Museum of Natural History to see a scientific T-Rex, but now they come and they see a Lego T-Rex and they get to make that connection that, wow, we could discover more about science through art and through building. So by this point in the story, you're probably wondering why is there an art exhibit inside of a science museum? By the time you walk through the whole thing, it becomes pretty clear. Well, because science is very interdisciplinary and art fosters creativity. And in order to solve real world problems, they'll be needing to draw upon the creativity that they grew up with. At the end of the exhibit, children can manifest all that creativity they absorbed from it by creating with Legos. One station features a Lego music box where little engineers can arrange different colored bricks to produce different sounds. Arts and Architecture introduces some basic math skills into Lego building. We found Hugo and his dad hard at work on hidden hands, which encourages kids to explore their sense of touch. Um, I'm trying to build a duck. Without any creativity, I think science would be really, really hard. Because how otherwise do you invent things? You have to be creative to come up with new ideas. It's hard, but it's, it's kind of challenging. All of the pieces in the exhibit are the work of renowned Lego artist Nathan Sawoya. A former corporate attorney, Sawoya quit his day job to pursue his passion and now works full time as a Lego artist. I like creating art because I like the way it makes me feel. Just sitting down and putting those bricks in my hand, snapping them together, it's like the whole world snapping into place. A feeling that Sawoya is passing on to a whole new generation of kids learning from Legos. If you would ask him, my son, Hugo, his excitement was probably coming from the dinosaur that we saw. I build a lot of Lego and I know how much time. So I feel like the bigger the build is, the more time it takes and it just makes it look really cool. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science on CUNY TV. Dogs are man's best friend, and the secret to that relationship might lie in the eyebrow of the beholder. Here's Donna Hanover. New research explains in part how the dogs we love are able to win our hearts. Most of them have a muscle called the levator above their eyes that allows them to lift their inner eyebrows. Animal behavior expert Julie Hecht met us at the Hunter College Thinking Dog Center to tell us why that eyebrow movement matters. So when dogs make this expression, it really does essentially melt our hearts. Like it's a very endearing um, expression that we might associate with sad or cute because when they raise that muscle up and give that expression, we're seeing a bigger eye potentially, which we find cute and attractive. More so, infant-like. And more infant-like, 100%. So all of these things, are eliciting our caretaking response. The new research was led by Dr. Julianne Kaminsky of the United Kingdom with help from several U.S. scientists. The main finding was that dogs and their closest relatives, wolves, have similar facial muscles, except most dogs have the LAOM, the levator muscle. That allows dogs to make what is coded as the AU-101 movement, raising the inner eyebrows with much greater intensity than wolves can. The researchers called it a striking difference for species separated only about 33,000 years ago. Is evolution at play? Did the levator muscle actually develop because it made people want to provide dogs food and shelter? The scientists said, 
we show that these remarkably fast muscular changes can be linked directly to enhanced social interaction with humans. Julie Hecht says the eyebrow movement does seem directed mostly at people. These dogs aren't, to, to the best of our knowledge today, aren't using these movements with other dogs. They're really using these movements in the presence of humans. The scientists studied nine wolves in two different animal parks and 27 dogs from different shelters. What's really interesting is they found that in in um, a set of shelter dogs, dogs who performed this behavior of inner brow raise were adopted quicker than dogs that performed this behavior less frequently. Especially in this context of a shelter, we might see that, um, that inner brow raise is sad or, you know, please take me home. Now, what that behavior actually means for the dog might not necessarily mean that, but we are projecting onto them, and therefore those dogs that put on the inner brow raise more often were scooped up and taken home. Julie, who is a Ph.D. candidate at the City University of New York Graduate Center, cautions that more research is needed about why dogs are raising their inner eyebrows. It also might just be something that they naturally do when their head is down and they're looking up. They just naturally make that expression. So we really need to test what those behavioral expressions mean for dogs and not just put our human um, human like assessment onto it. In any case, eye contact with your pup does have important results. Julie has written about research that oxytocin, the cuddle hormone famous for helping mothers bond with their babies, also comes into play when people and their dogs gaze at each other. What's pretty exciting is that when you take a dog and a person who know each other and have a relationship, when they look at each other, the levels of oxytocin, kind of the feel good, the bonding hormone, increases in both the human and the dog, which gives us a sense that when you have this known pair um, and they know each other, looking at each other feels good and it reinforces their relationship. So if you're spending time with your dog or thinking of adopting one, make sure you have a bit of eye-to-eye -eye gazing time. Watch if your pup keeps your attention by lifting the inner eyebrows. It'll bond you, as science says it was meant to do. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. Feeling unusually crummy this time of year? It could be sad, seasonal affective disorder. How about you? New York winters. Relentless cold gets dark early. No wonder we find ourselves in varying degrees of depression. We're sunlight deprived. Sitting in front of a bright lamp for a period of time every day is said to improve your mood, but not just any artificial light is effective. A therapeutic light box that's specially made for SAD needs to deliver a certain brightness as measured by the unit called lux, which is a unit of brightness. They deliver 10,000 lux at a certain distance from the eye. Dr. Norman Rosenthal is a pioneer in identifying and treating winter depression. Yes, I coined the phrase seasonal affective disorder with its acronym SAD. Seasonal affective disorder usually refers to trouble with the winter that reaches a certain level where you are no longer working effectively, your relationships are affected, you withdraw from friends and family. The winter blues is a milder version, so you may be functioning okay, but you're not feeling great. We believe that the light coming in through the eyes sends signals to the brain that affects our brain chemistry in areas involved in mood and well-being. Certain people must lack certain either enzymes or receptors or chemicals in the brain, we don't know which they are yet, that render them less able to respond to the light. So that's why they need more of it. And when winter comes and there's not enough light around, it falls below a certain threshold, and that's when these symptoms emerge. I would recommend, ideally, a light box with a surface area of about a foot by one and a half feet or one foot square. That's going to give you more light that is more likely to work on your SAD. I want to emphasize that this light therapy comes in through the eyes, has no ultraviolet light in it, and doesn't benefit your skin or harm it. There are other methods of treating seasonal affective disorder in conjunction with or in place of light therapy. Antidepressant medications can be used. And don't forget natural remedies like going and walking outside on a sunny day. That can be extremely helpful. Not easy in the winter. It's true that people with SAD are not motivated. 
But if you can figure out a way to get motivated, once you get outside and you start walking, you'll feel better and the habit will reinforce itself because it'll make you feel better. It's called cognitive behavior therapy. I'm never going to be able to walk outside, it's too cold. Well, who says? Did you try? Did you put on a sweater? Did you go outside? No, I don't feel like it. That's a behavior. Well, is there anybody who could help you to feel like it? Is there a friend that you could go walking with? Then you could modify the behavior. So. Cognitive behavior therapy is geared towards affecting your thinking and affecting your actions in such a way that your mood improves. And if all else fails, book a flight to the Bahamas. Sounds like a plan. The Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, is a beautiful natural light show that lights up the night sky. Our Ari Goldberg traveled all the way up to the College of Staten Island to find out more. In this observatory at the College of Staten Island, Professor Irving Robbins is able to show off the starscape to a city population that might not often get to see it, and to teach his students about wonders in the night sky, like the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. My first experience with Aurora, and I just lay there for hours watching the sky fluctuate and move around, change colors. I hate to say it was like getting stoned but on the heavens. While the mechanisms that produce this light show are quite complex and not even entirely understood yet, in fairly simple terms, the aurora borealis is the result of the interplay among three things, energy from the sun, the Earth's magnetic field, and the Earth's atmosphere. The sun is a boiling cauldron. The outside surface of the sun is a blazing temperature, right? 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. As you move out, actually it gets hotter. And so what's happening is the sun is boiling away in a sense and it's throwing its guts out into space. We call that the solar wind. This solar wind is the charged particles of ripped apart atoms, hydrogen protons and electrons and alpha particles shot out toward us. We have a shield that's sitting there, like a shield sitting there like this. As the wind hits, it diverts the particles. All right? What is that shield? It's the magnetism created in the core of the Earth. If you Google the core of the Earth, it turns out there's two parts. There's a very, very solid iron core, basically. It's so hot down there that there's another section that's all molten. That molten is molten metal. Metal's a very good conductor. But that means there's occurrence and they're generating magnetism. But it gets exaggerated because the Earth spins at a pretty rapid rate. And that spin adds more strength to that field. And the result is we get surrounded with a magnetic field. So we'd play these little metal magnet bars in school. We'd sprinkle iron shavings on it. And we'd see the lines of the magnetic exactly. field. That's sort of what Earth is pretty like. Overall, yes, it's a nice way to visualize the creation of the field. So now you have this magnetic field. Because charged particles interact with a magnetic field, it gets deflected away. That's the shield effect. How important is this shield? If we didn't have the shield, is that a problem? If we did not have a magnetic field, we wouldn't be talking. We'd probably be dead. This shield protects us from the otherwise devastating particles of the sun. But just like that school magnetic bar, the field isn't a perfect sphere. Some particles are able to get in at the poles, and some get channeled along the field lines as well. And that is why the northern lights, or the southern lights, are centered on the magnetic poles, where the particles get close enough to hit the atoms of our atmosphere but they get through and they hit the atmosphere. Now you got fireworks. What's the fireworks? When you now have atoms, right? when atoms get energized, they release light. So what happens is when that stuff hits an atom, atoms get excited. We call that an excited state. The atom's nice and happy, it's contented, it's not bothering anybody. Boom, energy hits it, electron tries to get away, atom says, no, no, you're not getting away, pulls it back, all right? And that process, it, it had higher energy, it loses the energy, it becomes a photon of light. And all those colors of the northern lights? That all depends on which atoms in our air are being excited by the sun particles. Each atom has its own unique signature. Oxygen gives us the green colors, sometimes red, depending on uh, circumstances. Nitrogen in the atmosphere will give us some blue, maybe some violets. It's not common, but we can see the aurora farther south every once in a while, when the sun spews out a massive wave of energy in the form of a solar flare or coronal mass ejection, more than just the constant solar wind. The velocities of these particles are so insane. Typically, let's say, slow particles 200 miles a second. That's how fast these things are moving. That's the slow ones. Faster ones are moving 10 times faster. Gets to our shield, you can have auroras down here in New York, and we've had auroras down here in New York, even, even down to the equator at times. In fact, as recently as November 2015, 
high solar activity meant that parts of New York State were able to catch a glimpse. It may not happen often, and we may not even understand all of it when it does. That's no reason not to look up. In this field of astrophysics or astronomy, when things are far away and you have a little data, everybody's happy. But when you're right on top of something, and, but we have so much information that we're confused, that makes it fun for those people in this field. Of course, living this far south, it's very rare we'd get to see the northern lights from here. However, if you get out of the Manhattan lights for a night and come down to the observatory at the College of Staten Island, you'll see there's no shortage of beauty in the night sky, even in New York City. For Simply Science, I'm Ari Goldberg. We'd like to thank our friends here at National Geographic Encounter Ocean Odyssey in Times Square. And if you'd like to know more about this exhibit, contact them at natgeoencounter.com. And if you want to know more about us, Simply Science, go to tv.cuny.edu and Facebook and YouTube. I'm Barry Mitchell. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time on Simply Science. Ba -ba